you know, appreciate that. Uh, another another right line session. I think this is our first Wednesday. I mean, normally on a Friday, so yeah, fit in some extra ones in, um, just to keep up with demand. Um, it, yeah, so it's really great to have you with us. And obviously, there's a lot going on in your world at the moment with the Euros and the Olympics and, and a lot of other identities. Um, if it's possible, just for everybody that's in the meeting, just to go back to for us to go back to the start of when design first played a part of you know first became a significant part of your life, whether that's education or you know your first um, roles in the industry, and then just if you don't mind just step by step leading us up to where you're at today and then we'll, we'll pick apart a bit more of the um, your work at the BBC. Yeah sure um well I suppose it, it was never I suppose from a, a design point of view and advertising and all that communications um I suppose it's something I always I didn't know I liked until I got into the industry um for example, there's a lot of uh, things like ads that I sort of used to love growing up and, you know, used to really get excited when something new would come on. Um, and I kind of fluked my way into the industry, really, uh, with, with no no grand intentions of doing so. So I went to uh, Bucks Uni and did a, a very dry, very boring marketing and management degree. No idea why I chose that course to this day. Um, but that led me into uh, doing some copywriting. And the first place I got a job was a place called uh, Butterfield Morris Bushel, which was in Luton, um, which was a, a big sort of design agency with, I suppose, ambitions to get into advertising. So that threw me straight into a design department as the as a sole writer, um, which was interesting. Um, but that kind of gave me, um, I had to hit the ground running, really. It gave me a an opportunity to you know work with design and start to appreciate how words and and layout work best and you know the power of of good copy and things like that um so i did that for a couple of years um uh, then I, I i had a year in london uh working for an agency called bd network um who basically did a lot of sales promotion work um which i didn't really i didn't really enjoy and TV and things like that. Um, so I went back to DMB for a year and then uh, my big break kind of came when I went to uh, Big, who were in the sort of early 2000s, known for doing um, things like WKD and Domino's, which it was kind of quite a laddie culture back then. I don't think we were anywhere near as sort of aware of equality as we are now. Um, but that was basically writing knob gags all day long for <laughs> WKD. Uh, uh, and massive headlines, which obviously, as a, a writer working with designers, if you're going to get a massive headline, that's um, that's good. That's good for good for my point of view. Uh, then we went to McCann in uh, Birmingham. We were there for four years, which was, was brilliant. Um, the great thing about that experience, we were always the youngest. Tim and I, who I were, we were I keep saying we. I mean, Tim Jones, uh, my art director, who was a designer when we first met and became you know, our direction became his thing. Um, we were always the youngest team. We sort of joined McCann at the start of a um, uh, recession, which meant no one was hired for the four years we were there. So we were kind of always the youngest, but that gave us an advantage because I think a lot of good work comes from being perhaps more culturally aware, culturally in touch. And when, you know, you're in your late twenties and all your other creatives are sort of mid forties and above, there's, there's a huge, gap between your sort of cultural awareness things that mean mean a lot to you um so from there I did a, a little stint at McCann Berlin um then went back to big as group head for a few years then back to McCann Manchester uh to work on Aldi which was um brilliant that was a, a ginormous agency um but it was a, a diet of pretty much nothing but Aldi for for two years um and then the BBC came knocking um and at first, we, we actually turned the BBC down uh, twice. Uh, we didn't really entertain the conversation at first because we thought it would be just be making trailers for EastEnders and stuff like that. Um, but I suppose for Tim and I, our ambition was always, our dream agency was always for creative. Um, from the very early days of our career, we always looked at the work that for creative do um, as just being out there, just being really of the moment, really in the zeitgeist. Um, and then the BBC launched BBC Creative, so it was the BBC took everything in house. It did have a, a 
a roster of agencies before then. Um, and when we were told, you know, we were asking what the ambition is when we started to really talk to them, and they said uh, to make the, the the best communications in the world for the world's best broadcaster, uh, that really sold us. And then we, we felt like we could really, really make a difference and really get some good, meaningful stuff out. Yeah, wow. So, so did you and Tim, do you work, how does that work as a partnership then? Do you go? Yeah, so uh, as advertising teams, you work as a, a writer and art director combo, and it's a, a collaboration process where you know I think in words I suppose when I was working in design departments it wasn't so it wasn't so fluid I think designers often think um which I don't know I think I don't know, freezer uh designers I'm saying uh, work more executionally whereas art directors work more conceptually so it lends the art director is lent better towards in the advertising world um so yeah, we work together. We have done now since uh, two thousand and seven. Uh, so it's it's actually my longest relationship. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that works in other industries, isn't it? Quite commonly, you know, music or you know theatre. And- yeah, collaboration is important. I think to have someone to bounce something off. So, um, you know, whether it's a you know another designer, it could be you know a planner or a project manager. Just people you can kind of spitball and argue and. Yeah. you know test what their thoughts are uh, but often with Tim and I maybe I'll come up with a, the idea Tim will embellish it we'll just bounce it back and forward and that's that's how we get to the good stuff and it's you know it's really worked for us for you know 15 years yeah so if you out of all of those agencies from what I know of the ones they, they're all pretty substantial in size aren't they they weren't you know selling the cans of- yeah they're all these I suppose the smallest place of words was probably BNB, which was still at the time, you know, 60, 70 people. Um, obviously, Big was starting to die a little bit when we were there, but the McCann agencies, um, at the very least, are sort of 300 people um, in Birmingham and a similar number in Manchester. Um, and then McCann Berlin, again, a, a, a big, big place, um, which works all over the Germany, the McCann network across Germany is, is huge. Done how, how, you, how did you find that, like those experiences? Because I've spoken to quite a few people in during these uh, right line sessions, and a lot of them have had experience of larger agencies, especially in you know, bigger cities. Yeah. Some of them have, felt, have found themselves launching their own businesses or their own studios because of those experiences. They've got a little bit jaded of the, maybe just being a small part of a bigger chain and not having yeah. that connection. Whether I can see how that goes. I think you can, it's funny, in a, a big agency, you can, if you're not, um, <clears throat> if you're not kind of doing the the work that everyone's seeing, you, you can get buried a little bit in that, in that process. And they tend to be quite political places where I suppose Tim and I have always kind of had an exterior confidence where we've been able to sort of, sort of thrive in, in that sort of environment. But yeah, to us, the you know the the pull of starting our own thing has has always been strong, and it's always been you know ten years or more. Um, but we we kind of we get into a point in our career where maybe the the jump to start your own thing you know becomes riskier and riskier because we've obviously got families and mortgages and 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 things like that. But you know, I'd I'd implore anyone to to consider doing their own their own thing. Once I've got a bit of experience, of course, it's a, a really great thing to do. Yeah, and I think I, that people that I spoke to, especially younger people, it's more a case of just having that gut feeling to do it as opposed to it. Mm. Let's say being the correct time, it's just a, it's just wanting the freedom maybe to be able to take the kids to school so you have that flexibility to do, you know, your own thing. Or Exactly, and I don't think, it's like there, there will never be a right time. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's some, a bit of advice I was given, it was... You just kind of have to take the plunge. It's, there's never going to be a perfect moment necessarily. You just got to, you just got to have the the guts to to jump off the cliff. Which, to be honest, Tim and I haven't quite had enough all the, of. That. All the stupidity. I think that's what that was the same <laughs> case. It was just stu- being idiotic enough to not care less what what comes about. But uh, yeah, that's a different story. Uh, <laughs> moving on to into into the BBC Creative in your world now, uh, James. Yeah. It, did it launch? So I correct in thinking it launched quite recently as a. Um, yes, uh, so I think it was 2017 uh, BBC Creative Lords. Before that, um, it was handled by a company called Red B Media, 
um, who did all the sort of promo design. And uh, there was a roster of agencies as well about, um, I think there's about nine or 10 different agencies around the UK that would do various things. So you had your ad agencies doing big campaigns, design agencies uh, doing bits um, and social agencies. But we just took all that in-house. And I think the investment we taking all that money it's allowed us to i think attract some of the sort of best creative people the best motion designers around um you know to come and come and hang out with us and you know even on sort of getting them in on freelance so the bbc works on a basis where actually one third of the bbc is is freelance staff so we find that everyone kind of wants to do a stint with us which is is a lovely place to be it's you know nothing worse than when i was at mccann ringing around freelancers and no one could be quite bothered because you know the work isn't that sexy but i suppose when you get somewhere like the bbc it generally is because every project we do you know is already within popular culture it's not like we're like ad agencies trying to get you know a jar of coffee or a bag of carrots into popular culture and get it talked about we're already there so it's a, a very attractive place to be working you know doing communications for the media industry yeah so what does that look like the the uh, bbc creative as a as, is it would you like to call it a studio or is it just a yeah well we are a studio yeah um there's so we have two sites we are effectively one office but we exist in in London and in Salford, in Manchester, and we had there have been talks about spreading that out as well. So looking to sort of the the northeast, looking at Birmingham, looking to Cardiff and you know Belfast, you know how do we how do we spread that out? But it's so it's roughly a hundred and fifty people in total. Um, most of what we do, say ninety percent of our work is promos, which is um, cutting you know people sort of creatively editing a trailer together um then we have the stuff where we spend most of our budget which is the conceptual stuff you'll see so the olympics trail and the euros trail where we'll, we'll spend you know real real money and resource on that um and then our design department is pretty huge really um it's you know, I always, it brings me out in sweats when I look at the sort of the organisational graph of design. There are so many people doing so many things. Um, predominantly it's motion design, but we have a lot of, um, you know, logos for new shows. And then we also reach out. So the BBC Two Idents um, that were done uh, maybe two years ago now, two, three years ago, um, was done by Super Union um so you know huge you know a-list design house um and we work with them so as creative directors we'll effective we'll effectively be their client and we'll be inputting on their work but you know you kind of let those people you give them the ball and let them run with it and it's you know we're, and we're just there to sort of guide them along we're working with um man versus machine at the moment on a a new bbc one brand identity um, coming out hopefully at the back end of this year um, so it's exciting we just you know and these people are glad to work with us they're I don't think they're charging us top dollar because the BBC doesn't have mm. you know swathes of cash um, but it's it's great that people recognize that you know the institution um, that it is it's you know important and you know sort of in, intrinsically British and it's you know part of all our lives yeah, it must be that must be a real good place to be if you've got an in-house team with you can attract great um, full-timers, freelancers, as well as then outsource and collaborate with you know, people yeah. that maybe they aren't ingrained in the politics of the organisation, you know, mm -hmm. you know, their own uh, view on the world. It must be quite a nice space to be. Uh, sorry, I missed the end of your question there. <laughs> you that, yeah. I was just thinking yeah. that must be quite a good place to be if you've got a, a big in-house team which is you know evolving in its own right but then you've also got the access to get some of the best creators yeah. in other areas yeah it's lovely it's just feeling like you because you kind of as a creative director you just you just want the best people working for you um and you know you know uh selfishly they they're making us look good um, <laughs> And then, you know, and that's important. And it's kind of, it's recognising that, you know, the 
people for the talents they have if um but you know that said you know we do get a lot of people wanting to work with us but there's you know we are very selective on who we choose and it's often you know talent is important but uh the energy and enthusiasm of, of those people you can you can really tell and you know it's important that you know people will i always say it's amazing what impresses me is when people go sort of to a level of craft way beyond what we really need to do you know we could there's halfway hours this week and everyone will probably be quite happy but those people that are willing like we did when we did the tapestry campaign for the world cup to push it so ridiculously far that the, the craft of of the piece becomes you know something that you know everyone is wowed by and gets everyone talking which is you know ultimately our job yeah i remember saying that i think you know you you know every now and then it doesn't happen too often but you sort of just stop and go blimey you know it's like that was the how do you do that and it's like, that yeah. moments where you sort of like, you hit you know, jackpot really isn't it? it's um yeah they're, they're quite rare but i think maybe it's because they're saturated and you see so much good stuff and then you yeah. see something you know that's just you know that next level you, know, you sort of just have to you know, exactly yeah if you can be the first pretty much to do something or you know to do something where everyone thinks it's cgi and you go oh no we actually yeah actually nearly killed ourselves actually making that um yeah why not it's it's something to be proud of and it's yeah it's why i think tim and i are as popular as we are um sort of within the community on the on social media and stuff is because of that you know? yeah when it's just when you sort of impromptu stand up in the front room just before a game and start applauding the graphics more than the game that's one of those sort of moments yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what has always been fascinated by, because I've never experienced in it up from a client side in-house um, of that scale, mm. what's the briefing process like? Do you have, does it come from the top? Does it come from people that are specific to, like, say, sports or news? Is it? Yeah. Uh, it no, so we have, a, we have a marketing department. So, you know, it is a political place, the BBC. The briefs in agencies, in your standard commercial agency, uh, are usually far smoother so it's a marketing director tells you know an account handler account handler tells a planner planner briefs the creatives away you go um we have a marketing department um who acts uh as a kind of conduit i suppose between the program makers so the people in bbc sport or you know the bbc one uh, uh producers and exec producers and they filter a brief down, they work with our planners to come out, okay, what's the proposition? How, what's the thing that's great about this? Um, and then it comes to us and our remit is often, you know, to uh, make work that sort of adds to popular culture and is gonna exist in popular culture. So we're looking for executions that are gonna surprise and delight people. So it's not always uh, a TV trail, that's kind of the obvious thing. Um, so we might do, you know, an, an outdoor stunt like we did for, you know, the Dracula billboard did really well. Um, the Alan Partridge email, for example, they're all things that are relatively low budget stuff, but if you can PR them in the right way, if you can craft these things and do something really cool and then PR them in the right way, they're just as effective as, as what we do on TV. Yeah, so in the, in the reverse of that then so that the, the briefing process could be quite long-winded and political what's the, the reverse of that in terms of presenting ideas is that just as as infuriating <laughs> at times uh, so yeah that, that never gets it that's the same wherever you go it's kind of i suppose we have to we present to the marketing team uh directly and because um you know we essentially sit together so sport bbc sport marketing uh one flight of stairs up from us so i can just walk upstairs which is brilliant to have access to your client mm -hmm. you know you can just pop up to their desk and you know what do you think of this blah 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 blah. it really saves time um but i suppose that familiarity and there's you know we do have a bit of a power struggle with them they want to kind of creatively direct everything we do and we you know we won't let them we want to do it our way but we we find a good working relationship um and you know, as long as we're we're working to the same objective and we've, we've got the same views as what you know uh, as to what good work is, yeah. um, which you know sometimes takes time if someone's new, you know that's it. But um, yeah, so I mean, certain times it can become infuriating, and you know I think we've got lots of amazing work that will never see the light of day. Um, 
some work you know the some great stuff gets through but there's also stuff which gets through which like anywhere you kind of think that could have been so much better if yeah. we'd have done that is it that's, that's quite interesting do you think if that would have been a different organization let's say for creative for instance mm. do you think some of those ideas would go through is it because well, they challenge or they push boundaries or they yeah just... i think for creative have a um a bit of an advantage in terms of their the the mantra of channel four uh is born risky yeah. that's there so the risk taking is, is sort of inherent in in what they do so it has to be edgy so i imagine they get work rejected for not being yeah. <laughs> provocative enough um whereas at the bbc we have kind of you know we have to we we can't offend. We can we can push stuff to the to the limit um, of what's acceptable. Um, but I suppose we're slightly we're slightly more risk averse. I mean, we do think we did a, an amazing thing. You know, RuPaul has really made us yeah. you know push what you know the flavor of what we do. The BBC Three stuff is always really exciting. Um, we're trying to skew younger because um, license fee payers are getting older. Um, and you know we're now you know anyone under the age of 30 hasn't necessarily grown up with you know four tv channels mm. and you know what they call um an appointment to view so we don't sit down at seven o'clock anymore to watch something because we can you know you can if you're watching eastenders for example you can watch it at midnight on iplayer or or whatever it's it's a very different audience so yeah we um we have a lot of a lot of challenges yeah, I suppose that's the nature of the beast, isn't it? You've got to reflect what the organisation is, isn't it? There's been no point in doing something just for the sake of it to cause controversy and then the programmes, you know, it's not not reflected in that. The way it's marketed, I suppose you just have to... Well, I suppose it's got guidelines like any organisation, wouldn't it? To, you know, you've got to... So, yeah, I mean, it's we're trying to... Uh, ...of the BBC in line, because at the moment it's a, it's a house of brands. It's, you know, the output of radio 4 is in from a marketing point of view is very different to the output of say bbc3 mm. they're wildly different but we're just trying to get everyone on the same page so we're all aiming for the same thing um and you know that will hopefully make us a better going forward yeah and those things take years don't they it's not like yeah. a small, yeah. small organization where you click your fingers and you want it done immediately um, you said something really interesting then when i was talking about briefing Mm. You said about BBC Sport marketing team. Um, it's good to have your client nearby. Do you, yeah. you, is that how you view it? Is that how you have to view it? Is it like you're being employed? Like BBC Creative is employed as you know being commissioned as you would be with a client. Uh, we kind of, I suppose, we kind of have that. We do have that relationship. We keep our distance, so we tell everyone at BBC Creative not to go native. Almost don't get too sucked into the politics of the place. That's. That's for the you know more senior people within BBC Creative to deal with that stuff, um, but yeah, I think it's I think it's really good. You know, when I was at McCann, having to wait a week for someone to respond to an email, um, when you know I can or any of our team can walk upstairs and talk to the relevant person, um, it's just very it's closer, it's more collaborative, um, and I think you know, relationships are, you don't get good work out if you haven't got good relationships. Yeah. yeah. Um, just, sorry, James, I just think, just popped in my head, I just think with all, it's, it's quite difficult to sometimes imagine the scale of, unless you're in an organisation like that. We we all know it must be big, but it's yeah. quite hard to imagine if you, you know, if you work in a business that's got, say, 10 people, where it's like to have all the 10,000, it's quite impossible to, <laughs> you know, to imagine. But then also the idea of where the output is then, is seen it's global isn't it you know world service is one of the most recognizable yeah. you know, brands yeah in the world. it's everywhere yeah do, absolutely are there, yeah. Are there, does that can you can that pressure get to you sometimes when you create creating ideas or when you're putting you know pitches together or do you have to sort of try and detach yourself from the idea that 20 million people are going to see the olympics or probably more than that yeah i don't i don't know if we ever think about it like that i think i think about that stuff when you know the morning it goes out and it's kind of you're hoping it goes down well. Um, um, I mean, it's it's a thrill, and I think you know all creatives, whatever you do, there's a bit of ego there where you kind of want everyone to see everything. And I think collectively, we we only put stuff out that we're confident in anyway. And I think that's that's a good place to be. If you're you're confident in what's going out, then you know you've got to trust your trust your gut and. 
yeah, there were times when we put stuff out that we think is amazing that absolutely flops and does nothing and nobody really notices or talks about it. And then there are times where, you know, you put something out, which is was a bit of an add on to a campaign. So we um, a load of posters for the Euros went up yesterday, which were always just another one, one extra thing that we'd almost forgotten a little bit about from a PR point of view, we're all about this big TV campaign. And those posters are already getting more traction on social media, um, people taking photos of them in situ than than the TV trail got. So, yeah, yeah, I suppose if you're confident in what if you've got an inkling of what you're putting out is a bit crap, then that's when the nuts come. Yeah. I just uh, I started to see some of the, the Euros uh, filter through. Yeah, uh, you shared some this morning of the, the yeah the more um, if you know you know sort of type of stuff you know about the slogans yeah. and the songs and yeah that, you know, yeah that's the hardcore sort of fan sort of knowledge. Um, what's a uh, for a campaign of that magnitude? What's the sort of time frame on that? Do you work to it's you know with the is there a well we, the, know, we all know it's coming, but obviously this year has been or last year has been a very rare um, you know pandemic yeah. sort of effect. But in in, in, in saying the standard. Um, four-year cycle of the Euros or the World Cup or the Olympics. Yeah. What's, the, what's the sort of lead times on that and how does that process work? Um, well, obviously the, the Euros, is, we got all the way to, we were about to shoot last summer um, and obviously all that work got canned and we'd start again. But usually um, uh, for the Olympics, we, we're being briefed in January um, and then we, t we threw, we probably within that briefing every, almost every creative at the BBC wants to have a go on that brief so we let everyone have a go on those things um so it's a big it's a fierce competition really so we might get sort of 40 to 50 ideas um of which very quickly you will fall will filter through let's say we got 50 we very quickly get rid of 40 um and then you get 10 you've got 10 decent ones and then we maybe filter that down to six or seven and get those kind of worked up and worked through. Um, and then we probably present two or three max. Um, and that's probably, so we start in January, that's by February. Uh, then through March, we're talking to production companies and um, uh, we start developing, you know, logos, um, you know, looking at typefaces, backgrounds, all that sort of thing. Um, and then it's full on production for probably about two or three months. Wow. Um, and, then, and then we're launching, you know, usually the, the key date for us is half time in the FA Cup. That's from a BBC Sport point of view, they will always launch a campaign at half time in the FA Cup because that's such a huge audience, just such a huge sport audience, I should say, yeah. um, for the BBC. So that's kind of, so probably five, five months, roughly speaking, is the, is the timeline. That's amazing. It's quite a, yeah, it's quite difficult to comprehend really the idea of that seems quite a short time you know, if, I don't yeah I mean we're, we're very focused I mean the, the creatives we who are working on those projects that's all they're working on um, we don't uh, necessarily give them if you as a creative win that project um, then you that is what you're doing and you know so Andy Parkman, who who wrote the current Euros campaign, has, was pretty much left alone to do it with Tim and I checking in with him every day as we we do everything else and, you know, overseeing everything else. Um, but, yes, yeah, it is very intense and the, the design team is pretty big on it as well. Yeah. Um, we have, um, you know, maybe two or three senior designers. Designers as well. Um, Yes, yeah, so it's a huge team team effort, and it, yeah, it, five months. Um, we're relieved when that five months is over because <laughs> it's often a stressful time. What does that look like from a, from the briefing perspective of that, say the Euros specifically? Mm -hmm. Design is so subjective, you know, across the world. But yeah, I was I just in my, my imagination, you've got something like that where you could come at it from so many angles. Mm -hmm. Is there something? Is it is it a, a sort of steer on? focusing on trends maybe or the output or you know the characters that might be involved like say the presenters for not yeah you know, it's got such a lively is there, is there anything that sort of steers you in any way or is that 
really um, start from the bottom up and just you know yeah well, we, st- we just start with an idea so the idea was um our wait is finally over so um you know we've had to wait uh rather than four years it's been a five-year wait for the euros uh so that is then generally i'd say developed um a look and feel was developed for the euros by uh blinking um and director nikos livesey so the tv stuff is done first and then once we've established that that look that art direction we then bring uh lawrence honderick and his team he's our head of design and we start talking about how we can create assets across the business so you know posters is just one thing there's our social media output there's the output uh what's going on tv um in terms of the channel graphics um and everything there's there's so many deliverables yeah. um and then we yeah we come to come to a point it usually starts off with um a typeface called bbc wreath which is the the corporate typeface um we often don't drift too far from that um and then yeah looking at backgrounds which make the whole campaign feel integrated so it's all coming from the you know the, the same place um generally it's matching luggage if you know what i mean it, you know everything kind of has to look the same and that's you know that's how we we the, the campaign hits because you know you need to be recognizing and getting used to this look and feel of, of whatever we're talking about yeah, the olympics know. though uh, being japanese is the most um uh there's very little consistency in what you'll see in the, the <laughs> Olympics because it's just Japanese culture and it's just in your face. Yeah, that, that must be dropping relatively soon, is it? Is that after your uh, end of that? this month? Yeah, very, very excited about that one. I think, yeah, hopefully everyone will like it. It's a CGI monster. Nice. Um, I was just thinking that because the, the, how do you, when you talk about like the matching luggage idea, how does the, when you've got a, a, um, a television advert, for the audience is so identifiable, you know, it's it's illustrative sort of style, animate, you know, um, very fluid naturally. When you come to things like print-based materials, posters, billboards, all the rest of it, is there a is there a struggle to some sort of get that to, to fit and work? The idea of you know, say an advert is very fluid; it has to be the sport is very you know energetic anyway. Um, to then sort of try to translate that because the billboards you dropped yesterday, the, the sort of secondary ones, they they're very much typographic, message driven, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, the problem with that, <laughs> the billboards, is that we can't... We're, the reason the whole campaign is animated is because we couldn't get players because of the um, pandemic. So you can't get any, any real access to players. And obviously, BBC, we don't pay for access either. So that was how we happened upon an animated route. Um, <clears throat> and then the, the out-of-home campaign um is typographic because the other risk we have is players getting injured and and not featuring so bbc being risk averse doesn't want to put gareth bale on a poster because <laughs> so law he'll he'll break his ankle beginning of may and then we're left with no posters so the the reason it's so paired back is is that and also because the tv campaign is essentially a big waiting room um it's probably more of a challenge on this campaign to what our executional output across design will be. And it was just, for, do you know what, let's keep it simple. Let's keep it to the idea of that we've been waiting forever for this and it's over. So, you know, a, a typographic route was, was deemed, deemed the best way to go. No, I thought it was really interesting when I first saw it, is that I, I, was, I don't know, in my mind, I was expecting some super polished, you know, football, the Premier League especially has gone in this route where it's, super high definition of you know everything is maximum sort of detail and it sort of it was a little bit reverse from that but then there's some really clever little elements within it yeah well you have to be different as well so the other i think in any any wherever you work in in a creative department it's all about um being as original as you can so it's something you've never seen before in that context so do you know what how many football adverts are animated Mm. um so we thought well that's going to give us stand out because everyone come all the big brands you know under armor nike itv have done it as well we'll probably just go for um a name on film yeah. so getting players to you know players don't act either they're kind of pretty awful people to work with <laughs> um 
and you're so limited in what you have with them. So, um, and I've done lots of, I did football campaigns for Vauxhall. Uh, generally speaking, you get uh, two hours with the footballer who, you know, they can't really perform. Uh, they don't want to perform. They don't want to be there. Um, getting them to take direction is pretty miserable. Um, um, and the Omi um, Oh Yeah, no, you just popped back in again there, Joe. I paused again, sorry. Um, I'm generally, I generally pause for about five seconds and then come <laughs> back. Uh, I was just saying, yeah, trying to try and, uh, give a footballer any sort of direction from you know, a film point of view or even taking stills mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> is really hard work. Um, and, you know, to get them to do something which, you know, you might have an idea, then they're never, in my experience, that happy to do stuff. Of all the footballers I've worked with, I can probably name two or three that were, do you know what, they were there for a good time and they were happy to do anything. Um, but, yeah, the vast majority... Uh, the hard work so yeah it's just it's just about stand out to do something executionally different to everyone else um that, that's that has to be difficult because going back to sort of saturation of creativity but saturation <laughs> of things like football anyway mm -hmm. you know from the days of that sound like an old fart one game on a saturday afternoon so like 20 games a day every single day yeah. of the world you sort of see the repetitive nature of stills of some of their arms folded looking mean and moody and you know all muscular mm -hmm. you know handsome or whatever yeah that gets quite boring after a while quite repetitive and you, you know and you need that refresh like you say to just to stand out to be you know talked about or from a especially i presume you're coming from when you talk about success of a campaign is that purely based on pr because then that leads to awareness leads to say um yeah it's, it's slightly different so it's like in an in the commercial ad agency for example you're kind of judged on you know sales figures and all that sort of thing or you know research into you know brand recall and all that sort of thing yeah um we measure ours loosely on viewing figures um and then we'll research it as uh the work as well to see is you know how effective is this campaign do you know randomly go up go up to people do do you recognize this campaign what are the bbc doing on the euros and if they can describe it roughly then you've kind of done a job and you you work's getting noticed um and then yeah hopefully as a result, the, the viewing figures will do, will do really well. Um, you know, sometimes we have very small budgets um, and, you know, it's generally the consensus that the marketing has brought more viewers to it. Uh, we did it with the, we did send an email from Alan Partridge to the whole of the BBC, which went pretty viral. You know, there was no budget on that, but we'd like to think that we actually, through the, the coverage and the talkability of that, that increased the awareness of that show and you know it, it did really well for its first few weeks yeah. obviously we're only judged on the first episode or two because if the program's pretty crap then generally people don't come back for episodes yeah, yeah. You, know, you, you suppose you can only change the things you can you've got control of aren't you? and you know, you're not uh, making all the shows as well <laughs> you've got to do what you can exactly. but like, the, like the perfect planet um the outdoor media as it, like you said mm -hmm. about the one i think you sort of step from a um, an outsider's perspective, it feels like it's really lifting up, you know, that talking about the BBC really appealing to an older demographic, but I think campaigns like that are really hitting home with, with across multiple industries, whether it's in creative industries or design, or whether it's younger people that are interested in sustainability in the planet. I think things like that are really essential for maintaining the BBC's future. Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, the BBC is in a, a real fight for survival at the moment, really. Um, you know, with the advent of, of Netflix and, and Amazon Prime and, and Disney Plus and all that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, we just have to get out there and get seen. And we don't, like I say, we don't have the budgets of Netflix. Um, so we'll do the, what we can, which, you know, is going to surprise and delight people and be a bit different and, you know, can translate into a nice bit of social media content for five seconds. And, you know, you can look, think that's great. What's that for? right move on um yeah. and hopefully it'll it'll stick in the mind somewhat yeah i think with also there's um yeah i think as, as long as i can remember the bbc has always been a bit of a beating stick because it's obviously publicly funded and, yeah. yeah it's just the way it is and in, in, in recent um weeks and years some of the sort of um, things that have come out are, aren't always uh, don't always shine a good light on the organization but they, no. 
Mm -hmm. Is there, a, I suppose this would really be the final question looking at the time, is that, is there any added pressure on some of the things that you guys do to, to get the right tone of voice, to get it, in the, get it into a place where it, it can fight those fires and, and maybe show that it is, it isn't where it is. Say things like Martin Bashir, we're not here to talk about mm -hmm. this, but you know, things that have happened 10, 20 years ago, that's not really where the BBC is at now, but people still have that view that it, it is. Yeah. It's creative and you know, like marketing and wording and copywriting and all of those things. They could they can play a massive part, can't they? Really mm -hmm. like, you know, in, in the confidence of people. Absolutely. I mean, we have a, a department called editorial policy who check everything we do when it goes out and will let us know the the perceived risks and what we get and attacks. I mean, if I post something, I'll get someone will say something or I'll get a message about wasting license fee money and all that sort of thing. Um, the BBC, I mean, the BBC is terrible at, at defending itself. The Martin Bashir thing, you know, 26 years ago or whatever, 25 years ago. Um, and it's a very different organisation now to when it was then. And, you know, I'm not, definitely not saying what he did was was fine or don't worry about it. But, yeah, it's hard to take at times when, you know, you've got Piers Morgan, you know, a guy who, you know, made fake photos of soldiers and people in the back of vans as is criticizing the bbc for stuff um you know, it's throwing stones in glass houses really but the bbc takes it um and because of the organization it is will investigate it internally properly this time um and almost punish itself and you know I, it's a great place to be i think from a moral point of view i think we've, we've got a really good standing but yeah, we're we're very sensitive not to not to offend. Um, and generally speaking, yeah, like I say, editorial policy lets us know what the risks are and what to expect. And when you know what to expect, you kind of think about how you would answer something if a criticism was levelled at you. And generally speaking, we're all we're all trained and, and briefed in, in from that point of view. So ready, ready to roll with the punches. Yeah, yeah. I suppose you've got to, aren't you? There's no point in uh, getting too wound up. There's always going to be people shouting louder than someone else just to you know just for their own gain out there so exactly exactly about mr morgan um <laughs> yeah we'll leave him alone uh, yeah now well, i hope for everyone that's tuned in that's because most of these talks james have, have really been with studios or freelancers and you sort of see it's nice to see a different world and we, we've we've got um four creative later in the year and it's again just right. a different perspective of where, where they come from yeah uh, but i hope for everyone that's tuned in that that you know sort of shines a light on on how that that the BBC alone works, but bigger, bigger organisations because you know not everybody gets uh, the privilege to work with them. It's um, it's good to see, good to hear about. So, so no, I really appreciate your time, James. Um, no worries, Tom. Hope you have a great rest of the day and week, and it'd be good to catch up again soon. But thank you for everyone for tuning in, and we're there, we're back on Friday with Anthony Burrell. So if anybody wants to tune in, tickets are available on on our website. So we'll speak to you soon. But have a great rest of the day, mate, and um, and like I say, we'll catch up soon. Nice one, Chris. Really? Take care. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Bye. <clears throat>